I think I died a hundred times before I, before I got drafted. <laughs> but, but it was, like I said, it's just something that had to be done. We went against the greatest, uh, two of the greatest uh, military mites to, in, in, in the history of the world, the Nazis and the, uh, uh, and the Japanese. Even though Everett did not have to go into the service due to the fact that he was a farmer, he felt that it was his duty to the United States Air Corps. Farmers did not have to go into the service due to the fact that the armed forces needed crops to feed the troops. Times of Great Depression took a toll on many families. Many were out of work and farmers lost most of their crops due to the harsh weather conditions. Most farmers ended up leaving their farms to find work. The Tuttle family, however, made a living selling wool when their crops did not grow. Times were so bad that some abandoned their families. Many older children who did not want their families to worry about feeding them left to find their own lives. They rode freight trains to travel across America. Ever, on the other hand, was born to an unwed mother and put right into an orphanage. Later on, he was adopted by Mr. and Mrs. Tuttle. He grew up in Mohall, North Dakota, 10 miles from the Canadian border. My, my dad and mother came up there in the early 1900s. And uh, the, he, he, he was a farmer and rancher who we brought up horses and cattle and sheep and that. That's where we made our living. When the average income dropped by 40% from 1929 to 1932, many families struggled to make ends meet, not knowing how they would take care of their children, let alone have enough food for everyone in their household. Thousands of families were left homeless. Many families camped out on the Great Lawn of Central Park in New York City, while others lived in shanty towns. Street vendors walked the streets of New York City trying to sell apples. President Herbert Hoover's name became compatible with the hardships. New comic strips such as Superman, Flash Gordon, and Dick Tracy came out to keep children entertained. Due to the dust and drought, farmers lost most of their crops and animals. We had our usual winters and we went through the depression and the drought. And, and the, you put a field of wheat in, you know, and the grasshoppers take it one year, drought would come the next year. And then the next year, it'd be another dust storms coming up from Oklahoma. And, uh, and big old Russian thistles, them tumbleweeds, they'd start rolling. They're just fields of them. If you had two doors, you could open one, let it run, open the other, and go right through the house, you know. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no electricity, no running water, or anything like that. So you were just like, almost like uh, pioneers, almost. <laughs> you, you got a pair of overhauls when, when you went to school. And I remember the first day in school, I got in a good fight and I tore up one. Well, I lost a hell of a fight when I got home and my mother got a hold of me, I'll tell you that. So if I got in a fight, I ended it early. So he was brought up fighting. If you lived during the Great Depression, you grew up fighting. You fought to stay alive, to find food, and to support your family. Children cannot usually get new toys or clothes, so they found ways to entertain themselves and make their clothes last as long as possible. You still take care of everything you got, because that's probably the last thing, you know. So you had a suit, you took it off when you come home from a, uh, a social event, hung it up, because that was the only suit you got, you know, for another year or two till you outgrew one. In depression there, sometimes we got, uh, they shipped in apples, and we got We'd get a big box of apples and stuff, you know. And then we, we salvaged enough wheat that we would take it, my dad and our neighbor there, and they would take it to the mill and they would grind it up and they'd bring back so many bags, 100 pound bags of flour. So I took you through to just about spring in there. Honolulu, Hawaii, December 7th, 1941. Just before 8 a.m., the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor leaving behind complete devastation. All eight of the United States Pacific Fleet battleships and 350 aircraft were damaged or destroyed, but all of America's aircraft carriers were left untouched. Among the sunken ships was the USS Arizona. It was a complete loss, and it now lies at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Within a few days, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. Americans flooded recruiting offices to try to join the armed forces even before President Franklin Delano Roosevelt made his Day of Infamy speech on December 8, 1941, asking Congress to declare war on Japan. 
Everett, almost 19 at the time, was one of them. But by the time he got there, they did not have enough uniforms, and he did not get called until he was 20 years old. I just uh, started in uh, teacher's college at Minot, North Dakota. This, uh, this old tough old, he's a tough old bruiser. I didn't want to tangle with him. <laughs> he said, your butt will be out of here soon. I said, why? He said, the Japs just bombed Pearl Harbor. And I said, oh, God, they did. And then I, I went in, we listened to it in the radio. So there was no sense going to college. Many Americans were so outraged when they heard that Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese that they decided to drop whatever they were doing to fight in the war. They wanted to fight against the Axis powers, which were Germany, Italy, and Japan, and make the United States a safer place again. We all wanted to join right away. And they said, no, they didn't have enough uniforms and stuff or guns and stuff, wait till we were called. So I didn't get called till I was, uh, I was 20. I was, I was 18, almost 19 then. So I didn't, I didn't get called till I was 20 years old. The thing that, uh, uh, that stopped the Japs more than anything else, they didn't know what the personal armament was of the, of the Americans. I had my first rifle when I was 11 years old and took care of it and hunted jackrabbits and weasels and stuff to get my pay, to get my uh, spending money, you know, on that. So everybody had guns, and uh, and a lot of them had a lot of guns. I didn't. I only had a I had a 12 gauge shotgun and a 22 rifle. That's all I had. But uh, they they all had guns. But uh, the whole country just banded together. Many Americans became outraged after Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese. They joined the Army. Shortly after, they left for training. I started in uh, basic training in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado. And I was in there for three months for training. And then they started shipping guys out, and they lost my records. And I kept standing there doing KP, guard duty, everything. Finally, <laughs> finally they, they sent me back down to uh, Keister Field, uh, Mississippi. And that was the engineering school. And uh, I started in that. And I realized that I'm not mechanically minded. I could tie my shoes and that's it, you know. I didn't want to have the responsibility of the plane and the, and the, and the crew. So I deliberately washed out of there. So then I went into, uh, I thought, well, good. It's, I spent the, the, the winter down there in, in, uh, on Mississippi, you know, and got to go to New Orleans. And uh, first time I was down there, we had a pass. We went into town. They had a sign on the, on the docks out there. Soldiers and dogs keep off. <laughs> they, they didn't like the soldiers. They liked, like the Navy guys, didn't like the soldiers. <laughs> but then I went to Laredo, Texas, and uh, it was in the summer down there. And it was really hot. It was, uh, you're right down there, and uh, you're right in the desert there. And the, the heat was so bad that when you went up in them to, to, uh, on our training missions, we'd shoot, uh, shoot up targets or targets down there for training with our machine guns. And uh, I got bored of that, so they'd have target number nine come up and they'd have big planks on there, so we'd shoot, shoot, them, tar shoot them up, you know, and then shoot the other targets up. If they wanted to prosecute us, they could have, because all, all our bullets, like if I, that day maybe I had blue nose painted on all my bullets so they could count the hits, you know, and that. But, but on, on basic training, I trained with the carbine. It was a nice little gun to shoot with, and I shot the Thompson submachine gun. And we had a lieutenant there, he's a big heavy set guy. He put on a show for us, he'd take the Thompson submachine gun, put it on his chin and shoot the whole, whole, whole round off on his chin. It was something to see, watch him do that. When Great Britain requested to move prisoners of war to the United States, the United States government first resisted the idea. They feared that housing the prisoners of war would cause security problems and heighten the fears of Americans at home. The United States finally agreed when they found a way to relieve the citizens' fears. Prisoners of war would be housed in military installations and federal facilities. One of the facilities that they were held at was Camp Grant. Upon arrival, the prisoners of war had to get their fingerprints taken, fill out personal information cards, and they were stripped of their clothing. They were given green uniforms with PW on the sleeves, one pant leg, and a hat to be easily identified. The detention center was surrounded by guard towers, occupied by machine gunners, searchlights, and barbed wire. Their barracks included an office, a kitchen, and sleeping quarters. There was also medical care provided for them and a recreational center. 
there was an estimated 2,500 prisoners of war at Camp Grant. The detention center was closed in 1946, and all prisoners of war returned to their homeland. Now, the Nazis out here at Camp Grant, them guys, they were, they drilled in the morning, you know, and even though they were prisoners of war, for God's sake, <laughs> they put a fear in you watching them march out there and stuff. And a lot of them, you know, they worked in the Rochelle in the, in the uh, uh, vegetable places down there at canneries. They, they come back, back, you know, and they liked it so well. They, two, two prisoners of war missed a damn bus and they hitchhiked back to Camp Grant. We had them in our barracks and everything. They, they, like, I, like I said, we got to know them and uh, they were guys just like you and I. Then they took them, put them in, the, in their mess halls and these guys, they'd steal ice cream and bring it back to me and the, me and the tech sergeant that run this six uh, barracks that we had for, for uh, uh, deporting everybody out on there. People get along, governments don't, you know. Before Everett could go overseas, he had to leave Camp Grant and go to the last training. We went to uh, Casper, Wyoming. That was your last training before overseas. And that was kind of tough. We, we, met, we had a buddy crew that we, uh, we, we had trained with and we knew them and we went to, uh, we was going to go up on training missions the next morning. So we all went to the movie show together the us enlisted men, you know, there was just 12 of us all together. And uh, when they come in for a landing, they hit a, a live, the tele, telephone, telegraph wires, or the electric wires, and the plane exploded. It's their first experience, they lost the whole crew. That was the first day out. We, we weren't even there yet. Everett was a member of the 461st Bomb Group of the 765th Bomb Squadron. He was a nose turret gunner in the B-24 Liberator. These gunners had the most frightening view of the bomb run. They were at the front of the plane and in front of the pilots. The B-24 Liberator was recognized as being important in destroying the German U-boat fleet. Flying was usually very cold. The nose turret and fuselage did not have a tight fit. Therefore, cold air blew in through the gaps. Sometimes it was even 30 below in the cabin. Because of high altitudes, the crew would have to wear electric flight suits. These were used to keep warm since the cabins were not pressurized. You're so lonesome and stuff up there, sometimes I turn around and look, I think, I think, you don't suppose you're the only guy in this war alone, do you? <laughs> and look, I, just to see the pilot and co-pilot back of me. But then the guys would holler from the back and the front, what's it like up there? I said, you don't want to know. And they said, don't. I said, well, you could, you could at Vienna, I said, you can get out and walk on that flak if you want to. But, but you could smell the stuff. I don't know how, what, the, what they were shooting up there, but they could smell the stuff. The smell was from the smoke or the flak, also known as anti-aircraft gunfire. Sometimes the flak was so thick that the pilots could not see through it, and you could hear it hitting the plane like hail on a tin roof. You, you just, you, it's what you were trained to do, and you better do it if you want to get back. The European theater was much colder than the Pacific. It had worse weather, but the Pacific was a lot more dangerous. The casualties in the European theater were far greater because of the greater number sent there. The chance of surviving the Pacific was far less. Jeez, I hate to think of flying over that Pacific and on them bombing mission. You always had the feeling in Germany, you're flying over Germany, you looked like them people if you went down. But you went down in Japan, there ain't no way you'd look like any of them guys, you know. So it was, it was a fear thing. No, no doubt about it. I was scared. One of my friends was a, was a Marine over there. They'd hit them islands and them small islands. They said, you're going to, you've got six or eight hours to get to the other side where we're going to pick you up. If you don't make it, we're going to leave you. But, the, but they had island after island. And then the, the, these guys, um, another friend, he was on Guadalcanal and he was overrun. He had four bayonet wounds in his stomach. So the, these guys were, they were just fanatics, you know. They they they, they would they, they wouldn't surrender. So you had to kill them. That's all. That's all them guys could do over there was kill them, you know. And uh, if it, <laughs> sometimes they tell me his son took them prisoner, you know. <laughs> the lieutenant told, him, well that's your you got to feed him. You got to do this or that. So I tell you, they take him for a little walk out in the jungle there, you know, to so relieve themselves of the responsibility. 
The P-38 served in all theaters of the war. It was an effective fighter and was modified to be an effective night fighter and an excellent strike or attack aircraft. The P-38 also made its crew members feel safer because of its distinctive profile approaching. It had four 50 caliber machine guns and was tested to reach speeds in excess of 400 miles per hour. It was also capable of carrying an additional 4,000 pounds of bombs or weapons and 1,000 gallons of fuel with external tanks. It could reach a ceiling of 40,000 feet. But the first few uh, missions we had, we had the P-38s. Those guys were great. They went down and strafe first before we made the bomb run, and then they'd strafe afterwards. We'd peel off after the bomb run, either left or right. And then the ICAC would, you know, would, would miss us. The Russians, I, w I went over uh, Vienna twice and come back, and uh, the Russians, they got about a thousand flak guns out of there. Because we would go up on the Danube like we was going to fool them, you know. And they turn around, they come right down the Danube. And they was just sitting there waiting for us, you know. And they just sit there waiting for us. And uh, they were, uh, I, I tell you, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was terrific. When you are in the plane, many things can go wrong. And the only thing you are able to do to have a chance of surviving is bailing out. And then we head into Augsburg, Germany, and we was we really was careful there because they had a gentleman's agreement. If a bomber was hit and was going to go, the guys were going to bail out, they dropped their landing gear. And then the the Germans they would let you bail out. They probably shoot you on the way down, but they let you bail out, you know. So this happened to our 765th bomb squadron, and that was the one I was in. So, but these guys before us, they, they, they dropped their, their um, landing gear to surrender and they backed off, they quit shooting at them. So then the guys from the waist hollered up and said, hey, the fire went out, what do we do now? The lieutenant says, I'm gonna retract the landing gear and you guys start shooting. So they did and they shot down five of the Goring six yellow-nosed uh, fighter pilots, which is the pride and joy of a, of a Luftwaffe there. <laughs> but then what they would do every time we would go up into Germany, them suckers would fly right over every one until they found our tail markings and then they'd hit the 765th one. So, but they didn't come up that day, so I, we, got, we got by, I got back. I didn't, I didn't think it was coming back anyhow. Before every mission, I just packed stuff, put it in my uh, flight bag to send home to my mother and dad, you know. Operation Torch was the name of the invasion given to the Allied invasion of North Africa in November 1942. The Allies used North Africa to attack the Axis. They would move up the soft underbelly of Europe and invade Sicily. Uh, even the Marrakech, North Africa. We got the Marrakech, North Africa, and we stayed in a French Foreign Legion post. And it was an amazing thing. They had to, well, Big fountain looked like the Taj Mahal or something, and then they had the walls. They had broke. They they drank the wine, you know. They didn't drink the water, so they break the bottles off and the glass, and they put them in the cement walls when they were building them. So the Arabs they would steal everything they could, you know, and they'd climb them walls. So at the time they get to the top of the wall, they were all blood. They couldn't do anything. They'd drop off, you know. But that they had glass in all them walls around them. And then uh, we stayed there just one night, and uh, we was out there in tents. And as soon as it got dark, them guys would run through the camp about this high, grab anything they could, you know. See, we'd we'd won in North Africa, and we're pushing them up through Patton's, and them pushing them up through Italy and uh, and there. So uh, we went there because we would bomb in Northern Italy. We'd bomb in in Japan. In, uh, in Northern Italy, we bomb in Austria, we bomb in Germany, and uh, in Czechoslovakia. And if we, one of the things did, our, our this uh, major that was uh, in charge of our outfit, that my pilot, uh, I was telling you, flew the weather ship, they, uh, they went down in Russian territory, and they didn't get back, the Russians, they landed at a Russian field, it was about like a, wheat field or something, and they, and they was there about six weeks before they got back, or four weeks. But they see, they get back and they get to Yugoslavia. See, we liked Marshal Tito, because he was a, he was communist, but 
us guys, he'd get us all back, you know, because I think the government paid him so much ahead for every one of us guys he got back in time. So uh, uh, they'd, they'd hide us through the mountains and bring us back if we went down. So, so we like Marshal Tito. Mm -hmm. Now my friend was an artilleryman in the bulge, and the Germans run over, and we were just over there, and we just landed in it, and. Uh, and it was in a, below zero, and the snow, and the Germans had overrun them, you know, and the officers come by and told them, get, dismantle this gun and get in your Jeep and drive. Get back to the rear. So they dismantled the gun, and the four or five guys who were was on that, on that, manning that gun, they were driving along in this blizzard snow, and they hooked on. Boy, one of the guys tapped my buddy Roly on the shoulder and said, Roly, you hooked on to a German convoy. <laughs> well, <laughs> he whipped that thing over on the next road and he was gone. <laughs> there. But, but it was a lot of crazy stories. But those guys, I tell you, those, those infantry guys, I tell you, they were tough. And them airborne guys, they were tough, them Air Force, or them uh, airborne paratroopers. They were really tough guys. You'd soldier with them any day, fellas. Yeah, the, God, you had the mud and the snow and the sleet, and, and uh, you had the mountains and the hills, you know, all the time. Them guys like. We went into Newfoundland, Ganderfield, Newfoundland. And the funny thing about that was there was nothing but a blizzard up there when we got there. And it was so bad we had to put these canvas around the nacelles of our engines and I me and the engineer gunner I was I was assistant engineer there because I knew something about it <laughs> well I was I only weigh 122 pounds so he had to sit on me because I held over over the wings so I could snap all them on and get them on so we was there about three days or so but then we found out uh, uh, when we went when we took off it was a big lake and they took off and over it in a heck of a downdraft and we lost a crew there, went into the lake and killed. And then we found out that the Germans, in 1929, built that airfield for Canada. So, that, so then from there we went, into, uh, uh, we went into the Azor Islands. And that was an experience. It was all rocks in, in there, you know, and they had all the rocks, they made fences out of them, the peasants did. And all them peasants, they, they went barefooted. And their feet were about this wide. I think none of them had any shoes or nothing, you know. But one thing they did do, they made the best uh, champagne in the world there in Azor on the grapes. So we all bought a bottle of that. The, the pilot and the co-pilot, they was going to get married and they got back. So they was going to, they, they saved theirs. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't having, having any bad, any deal about that. I had a dear John letter already. I wasn't going back to see anybody. So, so me and the ball gunner from Oklahoma, we drank ours right away before, before we got even to Italy. The snow and storm was so bad we couldn't land in Italy. And so we finally went into Italy and uh, then we were treated, uh, I, I tell you how good we were treated here. Well, in Italy, this, uh, this one ground colonel, he didn't like the air, air groups, so they had all the Italians were working in the camp there. And we flew a mission one night, one day, and the next day we were out there. They had snow on top of the mud, and we was working with the Italians in the mud, shoveling mud around. <laughs> Pilot come out and saw that, and he went in and seen him about twice. He told him, the colonel told him, he says, you come back in here again, you're going to be out there shoveling with them guys. So, but he couldn't stand us guys out there working like that. So, but uh, that was the way things were. Even if you did not like the task you were told to do, it was your responsibility and you had to do it. There were drawbacks and rewards for being in the Air Force. We got our, our, our holiday in Rome. We, we survived uh, Vienna twice and uh, Linz, Austria twice, and so we went in to make a, well, make a combat record or something like we're doing right now, you know. And, uh, but we were supposed to, we were supposed to, uh, we got into Rome, we were supposed to go to a camp outside of Rome for, for our recreation and stuff. So we was in the middle of Rome and everybody looked at each other. We all jumped right out of the truck, you know, the GI truck. <laughs> and some Italian lady was there renting us rooms, you know, so we rented us a room. So we never did, I never did know what that camp looked like. <laughs> we got back just in time to get on the ship, an airplane, and get back to camp. 
broke, hungry, tired. Flying over storms was a difficult task, especially when you had to carry bombs. There was decreased visibility, and many times this resulted in canceled rates. We couldn't land in the place in Brazil. We had to go 180 miles north of where we were supposed to. We landed in Natal, Brazil, and uh, it was overnight there. Then the next day we went run over, and we flew over another storm off of the Amazon, and that thing is wide. I thought it was the ocean, you know, it was so wide. And uh, there was a C-47 flying with a bunch of the infantry guys with they got hit with lightning and all of them were in the hospital and stuff because they were all being banged up from flying around inside that plane because there's no cushions or anything. So then we got to British Guiana and uh, I, I told the engine, I, I told the ball guy, I said, we ain't going to make it. And we got through the war. I said, we ain't going to make it back. He said, oh yeah. He said, we will, we will. He, he's always cheery up and that. There'd be t t 10, five, 500 pound bombs on this side, 500 pound bombs on that. Then we had the 1,000 pound bombs. We'd only carry five, we wouldn't carry 10, wasn't room. But I, I didn't think we was ever gonna to get to the end of that runway and get in the air. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> where's that runway gonna end up? Every month, soldiers were given a paper to say what else was happening in other parts of the war. It, at our headquarters down there in uh, Tucson, uh, we had a paper they put out every month or every other month, and uh, guys would write in, and I had, and the pilot he would mimograph them off or zero mo zero extra off to me and send them to me to read. The military now is very different from the military in World War II. Military now is better equipped, they're better trained, the men are bigger men. They're, uh, I think we got a great military. I think we got a great military and. Uh, I just hope to God that, uh, I just feel sorry when I, when I see them, guys with amputees, you know, going over these bombs that are on, on the roads and stuff like that, you know. I just, man, I tell you. With all the improvements in our military now, we need to find ways to improve the generation. And each generation is going to find a time they have to adjust their lives. And it's, it's going to be tough. You can do it, though. If we did it, you guys can do it. There's no, problem, no doubt in my mind. <laughs>
I wanted to start by saying that I loved making this documentary. Although it was stressful at times, I really enjoyed it. Even before I started this project, I had a respect for our veterans. As the year went on, my respect grew. I now have an even greater respect for them. I never really thought this class would have this much of an impact on me. Coming in every day and working with Everett's story made me closer to him. I started looking up to him and realized that he is truly a hero. At the beginning of this year, I was not enrolled in the class, but I decided on the first day of school that I was going to give it a chance. Walking into this project, I didn't really know what to expect, and I knew very little about World War II. Listening to Everett's story for the first time, I was a little confused and didn't really know how to begin, piecing together everything that he had given me to work with. He had amazing stories that made me want to research World War II to get even more background on the events and places that he talked about. As the year went on, the more attached I got. All I wanted to do was work on his documentary. The more times I watched his story, the more interested I became. It also became so much clearer as to what I needed to do to make his story shine and reach its full potential. I realized that everything I needed, he gave to me. All I needed to do was put it together. I also started becoming nervous about the fact that I had all the power to either make this documentary great or bad. Towards the end of making his documentary, I became confident that I was doing a good job. I became very happy with what I achieved, and I hope that Everett and his family enjoy the documentary as much as I do. Making it has taught me so many life lessons, like overcoming obstacles that I come across. I am so happy I had this opportunity. I put everything I have into making it, and I believe that I will always have a special connection with my veteran, Everett Tuttle.